After 15,000 miles with our Tesla Model S, we've had a few problems. We also talk about the BMW i3 and the new Subaru Outback next on Talking Cars. Hi there and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm Gabe Schenhauer. We've owned our 2013 Tesla Model S now for 20 months and over 15,000 miles. Uh, it's our top scoring car ever in Consumer Reports test. It's a marvelous car to drive, but Gabe, it doesn't mean it's all been roses and Skittles and beer. Guns and roses? Um, that too. Yeah. No, um, well, that's, uh, that can happen. I mean, there are cars that are wonderful to drive, score well in our tests. But that doesn't guarantee that they're going to be uh, pro uh, trouble-free. What, so, what problems have we had with our Tesla? Uh, with our individual Tesla, we had, uh, I mean, at some point the door handles uh, weren't working very uh, quite right. And we, I mean, the, bit, the, the most serious thing was that the screen went blank. Well, you lose the which, center screen, you lose almost all the controls. Lose, yeah, I mean, that's the, the gateway. You have a steering wheel about, and about nothing else. That's it, yeah. I mean, so the car was drivable, but you couldn't do anything. No radio, no uh, no rear camera. No not, climate, yeah. Couldn't even pop the uh, charge point open because, you know, that you access it through the screen. What do you have to do to fix that? I mean, not that you fixed no. it. What do we have well, to do? That's <laughs> uh, the, the car uh, went to uh, the service center and uh, it needed a hard reset. That's something that the consu regular consumer can't do. Don't you just hit control, alternate, delete, and it just <laughs> reboots the whole the car? Problem, the problem is they forgot right. to put those buttons in. Oh. They're on the screen. Yeah, the blue can't. screen of death on the Tesla. Right. That's, that's right. never good. Just, just unplug it, plug it back in. So, I mean, it, it hasn't been a trouble-free ownership experience. No, it hasn't. Uh, but uh, it's important to say, and I've been asked, you know, does that change anything? I mean, as it is, I mean, the car is recommended based on its average reliability, based from, on from owners reporting story. to us uh, on the uh, 2012 and 2013. Now, I mean, uh, early this fall, we're going to have another annual reliability survey, and we're all waiting to see what that's going to unfold. Right. I want to step back a bit. Um, when we went out with the blog talking about the problems that we had with the car, uh, it got far more attention than you'd really expect. Well, I would expect at this point if like, like I spelled juice on the seat, like it would be a big story at this time. Because like Tesla <laughs> and you know, the word, like any pronoun actually gets a lot of uh, buzz these days. But um, I mean, you did, you did the um, cable news channel uh, yeah, yeah. Yesterday. So yesterday. Uh, in fact, we changed the podcast that we're showing today in order to talk about the Tesla. We'll have the episode we planned for today. That will be next week. Does why do people care so much? Well, they're really worried about this car and whether or not it's going to hold they, together. They're, not they're buy this car. I mean, you know, everyone. Well, they aspire to buy this car, and you know, and and maybe down the road they'll be buying a car from Tesla. Who knows? I mean, you know. There's the, uh, the Model X, the SUV that's coming out, and then down the road there'll be the Model 3, which is supposed to be much cheaper, maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. So it's, really, it's more about, you know, is this really a game changer for the industry? And unfortunately, you know, and, and you know, Gabe's right, it's like, this is our car. This experience is our car. This does not, it's, you know, the title isn't, Consumer Report's fine because Tesla is unreliable, because we do that from our annual questionnaire. Which has hundreds of people, not one people. Which has hundreds of people. It was over 600 people that we had on our yeah. survey last time. And, um, and you it's know, we actually have more to include the 2014 owners. It's very likely. Yeah. So, so last time, I mean, when we came out with last time talking about the average reliability based on our survey, we talked about the door handle problem because our because our subscribers who told us about the problems mm -hmm. that they had. And lo and behold, we had it too. You know, mechanical electric door handles, just kind of a fancy bit that Maybe just add kind of that. an accident waiting to happen. Yeah. But the way they took care of it was really interesting. So that one, it actually didn't go back to the dealer at all, but they fixed it over the air through right. you know 3G and and reprogrammed them. And um, you I know mean, that's an important thing though is that the difference between you having a problem with your Jeep Grand Cherokee. You know, say the infotainment system doesn't work in your Jeep Grand or Cherokee. Or your Dodge Durango, for instance. It would never break. <laughs> it Dodge Durango. Um, you know. You have to take it, you have to schedule a time with the dealer, you have to take it to the dealer. You, if it takes a long time, you don't get a loaner car. Tesla's really good on this count, isn't it? What yeah, they, I mean, this car has uh, received several over the air updates, uh, software updates. I mean, you, you can 
tell which one it has. And now it, it received the latest one, which is actually not over the air. That requires a, a an in fitment at the, uh, the service center. Now, if it has to go to the service center, what right. do they do? Uh, they come pick up the car and uh, they give you a loaner. I mean, we, of course, forego that privilege because we have a fleet of test cars, but uh, for a regular, ordinary customer, the car uh, gets picked up. Uh, it, uh, after a couple of days, it comes back all washed, all fixed. I mean, they, they would even proactively replace some things that they deem uh, that uh, necessary to replace. Uh, for instance, uh, our third row seat. I mean, the, the buckle broke, but they replaced it with an updated version. Now, there's no indication we're getting special treatment because of who we are. It sounds like any owner gets this treatment. It's probably something that really helps also drive the satisfaction with the car. Yeah, and the satisfaction is, uh, is amazing. I mean, we have record-breaking 99% of uh, owners have told us that, that they'd buy the car again. Well, you know, that raises... The naysayers are going to say, these people love their cars. They're going to overlook problems. They're not going to fill in all the little dots in your survey. They're going to just whitewash the problems. Well, and Gabe said it before. I mean, we, we've had you know, years and years in the history of vehicles that are unreliable and yet people love them. I mean, the Corvette is kind of a perennial favorite, right? right. You buy a Corvette, you love the car. You still feel this thing, so yeah, this broke, yeah, that broke. But it's different. And what's really interesting about Tesla, you know, again, is that you know, a lot of people ask, like, well, there's not a Tesla service center near my house, so maybe I shouldn't get it. And that is actually something that, you know, often people think about if they have a luxury car or a Porsche or whatever it is because they don't want to drive an hour mm -hmm. if they need to get some work done. Um, but here, they, that's not even in the equation. Right. Uh, it's on Tesla. Tesla's got to come out to you. They, you don't have to go find them. So it's possible we're kind of getting to this new world order where you, know, you possibly will have this car that has a few different problems. But since you're sitting there and they come up, pick up the car and drop you off one, it's not that inconvenience where you're sitting there going out of your way, taking off work, sitting in the dealership, you know, that's, that's maybe a thing of the past. Now, there's been different reactions to this. Uh, we put out a video yesterday detailing the problems that we had with the car. If you haven't seen that already, you know, check that out. We, we've had a range of, of opinions from that. One thing we heard from Go Infinity, I'm not an owner or a fan, but you are really blowing things out of proportion when describing such small and easily fixable niggles as problems. Is that fair? You know, for, for every person like that, there's other people saying... Oh, I've, I've got another person <coughs> like that. Wait, just, just I, I, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... You know, at Consumer Reports, we're very used to getting criticism on, on both sides. <laughs> we're completely too far to that side and that side. But, you know, we have thick skin. The point is, is that, you know, there has been reports of these cars having issues with them. We, you know, full disclosure, um, we have, we, we purchase about 70 cars every year. We own these cars for approximately 10,000 miles. Things go wrong, mm -hmm. and we don't go and tell people everything that goes wrong with these cars. Right. Um, because we go to the annual questionnaire, and that's what we're doing. So, but this is an abnormal number of problems for a car with 10,000 well, if anyone's 15, blowing it, miles on If anyone's it. blowing it out of proportion, it may be other media relying on our story. I mean, we really try to keep <laughs> it where it is. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we keep saying, I mean, this is a sample size of one. I mean, we'll wait until hundreds of real world owners will report on these problems. But I mean, this Tesla is, is really an innovative uh, startup. Uh, let me give you the flip side of the argument. This one came from Venom5809, which is kind of an appropriate name given what he said. That's what you get for blowing your load too early and giving this car ridiculous, undeserved, and unearned praise. This car has lots of serious issues and you lost a lot of credibility with me when the ridiculous glowing praise was heaped on it without it even being properly tested first. Well, so, also, so here's the thing. I mean, when we find something out, then our obligation to our reader is to report it and to be transparent about it. I mean, we're not hiding anything. I mean, we could have just sat on this information and waited until our reliability survey comes out and then uh, see what happens. I think but also if we know something, it, we might as well say it to our readers. No matter what, if that car is reliable or not, it's still, it rides extraordinarily well. It's very energy efficient. It, you know, it's extremely comfortable. You know, the car as a design, as the way it tests, Reliability is a separate issue. Yeah, I mean, just to get onto the uh, the blowing our load uh, comment um, so eloquently uh, that is, put that is by Mr. Subtle, Venom. Subtle. Um, <laughs> but the point is, is that 
our review was not, our glowing review wasn't about the stellar reliability of the vehicle. When we tested the vehicle, we talked about how it performed. And that was the 99 that it got, the, the testing of it, and all, for all these reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope no one thinks that our review was, this is the most reliable car has ever been. We've never said that. We never, none of our data shows that. Right. There is no way to uncover these kind of problems in a road test, even as thorough and as uh, elongated as our uh, road test. Right, and that's why we only, do these big, big, big survey right. with over a million people uh, of so answers. It's only during long-term long -term ownership that you're going to see these uh, problems that might crop up in a car. So, so in the, the end of October, we'll be releasing our new data from our, our latest annual questionnaire, and that will have the most comprehensive data of this car in terms of the reliability. We'll, I, I'm sure we'll have over, we'll probably have maybe even thousands of these right. vehicles um, over, and some as old as, as two or three years. Um, at that point, we're gonna determine the reliability of that in the longer term, and if the reliability falls below, the car won't be recommended anymore. Um, if it shows that it's doing well, it, it will continue, and we'll find out then. Yep, that's right, so uh, check back. We'll have that in probably a month or two, so that won't be that long. What we have now, what just came in this week, is a BMW i3. Right. What, or, uh... It's a rather different car. Oh, it's the most unusual car we've ever had here, I think. <laughs> was it more unusual than the Fisker? Yeah, I guess it was more unusual than the Fisker. Uh, what makes it so unusual? Well, first of all, it's, it looks like no other BMW looks like that. It looks like a tall kind of a pod that uh, is, is very, I mean, I'd say it's very unsexy looking, but it's kind of cute and interesting. It's a very intriguing kind of car. You know, it's a very different BMW. It's, it, it could almost be branded from anybody. It's a completely different BMW, but it's so um, clever and it's so smart because it just, it, it's a design from the ground up to be like the perfect car for the city. Well, what is it? What does it do? And I mean, it's, it's tall. You can see out of it beautifully. I mean, it's easy to get in and out of it. Uh, it won't consume any gas for uh, 70 miles or so. And, and then we and bought we, it with we, a range extender. Yeah, we bought the range ex extender, also known as Rex. And that uh, has a, a small motorcycle engine, a two-cylinder engine that acts as a generator, very much like the Chevy Volt in terms of uh, how, it, how it works. So it, it's electric, but you, it kind of relieves you from that range anxiety problem. So it, it's going to give you, it has, I think, a 1.9 gallon gas tank, which is yeah. laughably small. Uh, I think my lawnmower holds more, than, <laughs> my John Deere holds more than that. Uh, yeah, I filled it up for like uh, 675, and you know, the, the gas station uh, <laughs> looked at me and like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it'll give you a total of 150 mile range with the gas engine. But, Jake, does this car make sense? I mean, it, it, it's 50,000 bucks. It's leasing, it's going to lease for five, at least $500 with several thousand dollars down. If you just want an electric car, you can go lease a Leaf for under 200, a Volt's under 300. No, I mean, I think it makes sense for, for certain people. I mean, what's, what's interesting, if you look at any of these cars that are in the environmentally friendly market, I mean, what, what's the big winner? The big winner is the Prius. I mean, the Prius has just been the slam dunk. What's interesting about the Prius, though, is the people who buy Prius are often people that have a fair amount of money. They're not doing it necessarily to save money. They're doing it to more save the earth than to save money. And the Prius has kind of got like, this, like, Yaris-type interior, you yeah, know? I it's mean, it's not so nice. It's not so nice. So I think for a lot of people, this is almost going to be like a logical step up from a Prius. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to do something even more environmental. I'm I, gonna, I want the world to know I'm environmental. It, it, it says that. I, I want to have a nice place. The interior is fantastic. I mean, I own a mid-century modern house. All the materials are it's like, like what you see. Scandinavian it's, gallery. It, it's fantastic. The wood and the, the leather and the cloth and the tweed. I mean, it's completely different. You know, it's something completely different. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will attract buyers. It's a very cool car. It's a very cool car. Uh, let's get a little back to slightly more normal cars, but still extremely important cars for Consumer Reports subscribers. The redesigned 2015 Subaru Outback. Has what, it been redesigned? It oh. does <laughs> look like uh, it does the old look, one. It does look a lot like the old one, but <laughs> they fixed a lot of problems. Yes, they did. They had opportunities that, that they, they solved. <laughs> what are some of the things they improved? Well, first of all, the CVT isn't nearly as annoying. I mean, it's so much more palatable now. It almost behaves like a real multi 
ratio automatic transmission. Yeah, and that's a lot more, uh, more, more acceptable now. Yeah, there hasn't been a four-cylinder Outback in years that I wouldn't drive and feel, oh my God, this is so slow. This actually feels peppy yeah. enough. Right. What else? The infotainment system, it finally has one. Yay! And you can pair your phone and uh, you can, uh, there's a, a, a contemporary screen where yeah. you can Why access all these features. Why is that such a big deal for Subaru? Well, I mean, you could pair your phone before, but I mean, you know, <laughs> Subaru is, you know, usually the double DIN, you know, it kind of looks like, you know, the aftermarket system from 1988. It had a big crank on it. You just... There was a crank, yeah, and you know, you had an 8-track, but I mean, now it's, yeah, it's contemporary, it's got all the, the bells and whistles, and it actually works pretty, pretty decently. The other thing about it is just, you know, to get back to the driving dynamics of it, you know, I mean, Subaru's always rode but well, but I mean, the thing steers much better. I mean, they've really, you know, it's interesting because I mean, I was sitting there, at, you know, when they enrolled the thing at the auto show and I'm like, is that the new one or the old one? You know, I had the same, same impression. But underneath the skin, the thing really is improved. It's really striking yeah. the way this car drives. The steering is nice, the ride is the nice, rides. the quietness, yeah. they worked out the powertrain, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's a really, really nice family vehicle. It's a little scary. It's almost like every gripe we had about the 2010 to 2014 car yeah. was addressed. They really did. And it, it was interesting, it's like Subaru kind of went through this like little phase where they kind of got a little soft and, and floaty oh, and they whatever. Were, oh, and they were back, sloppy. But, but, right. They weren't sure. I mean, they went, uh, they were overly soft and sloppy, and then they fixed that, and the car became stiff riding. Mm -hmm. Now right. they kind of like, they, they finally they have the right balance. But, but like about 10 years ago, I mean, it's Subarus, well, before they had stability control, whatever, but I mean, they were really nice driving vehicles. They had this great, and we, we used to talk about, you they know, were the bargain man's BMW. It, they were, we they were, them. absolutely. The old legacy GT. The old legacy GT, exactly. But it's like they kind of, got they, they got their mojo back a little bit you know they're getting that really understanding ride and handling back and you know they're doing a great job and that car it, it shows it yeah yep. i got a question from a reader who uh, is thinking about buying one of these uh hey guys i just started my first real grown-up job i'm interested in starting a family in the next few years and i want a future proof because any new car i buy i intend to keep for years i'm considering getting a super outback because i think the space would be great if i have kids is it worth to hit the gas mileage in comparison to a mid-sized sedan like an Accord, Camry, or an Altima? MPGs are important to me. Man, uh, I don't, I don't, if you don't have kids yet. Yeah, you don't have kids yet, why don't you buy a GTI or a Mini Cooper S? <laughs> you know? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that, that might be going a little far the other way. Well, it, look, I mean, we need a conversation with this person. I mean, I, I've been taking this a lot because I've been doing... You know, I've been doing the, my triathlons, and I pop open the thing, and I throw my bike in the back, and it's got more room in there than a lot of small SUVs because it's so long. Oh yeah, that's and it's right. just a really function. I mean, even if you don't have kids, but you have an active lifestyle, this thing is a really useful vehicle. But I want to actually give an opposite opinion. I've been reading a lot of financial independence blogs, a lot of money blogs. Congratulations! It's great that you have your first new job, uh, but. He's not saying that he needs the space or all-wheel drive or something fun to drive. Or, you know, if you're worried about fuel economy, go get a used Prius. Go get a used Camry. Save 10,000 bucks because maybe five years down the road when you have kids, there'll be something else. Or actually that Prius or Camry will probably still be running. You know, and, and it will be perfectly fine for that. You don't need... The Outback's terrific. You don't need it for kids, though. Well, Jake said we need a conversation with this guy. Yeah, yeah, because there's, there's a lot of nuances. And yeah. it's, it's a very interesting point in life where you can save that 10 grand, you can retire a couple so years early. the kids, so. but where is the wife there in that picture? I there mean, there is a, that, there, there is that There needs to too. be a date for us, so, I mean, are you going to the date with a Prius, or, I mean... Can yeah. you get a date with a Subaru <laughs> Outback? Can you get a date with a Prius? <laughs> <laughs> it depends where he lives. <laughs> There you go. Certain neighbors, I think you'd do, you'd do just fine. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. We covered a lot of ground. Next week's episode, we'll talk about the Honda Fit and the Porsche Macan. We'll see you then.